Chris Woodfill speaking, and I would like to introduce you to Doug Rowland, and he's a filmmaker for the project that we're going to be working on called Feeling Through. Back in August of 2011, I was coming home late one night. I was out in the East Village in New York City, and I saw this man standing on a street corner by himself. And as I got closer, I saw that he was holding a sign that said that he needed help crossing the street and that he was deaf and blind. This is the first time I'd ever encountered a deaf blind person. So initially I tried to talk to him and quickly realized that wasn't gonna work. But when I tapped him, he had a notepad that he uh, wrote to me that he needed a certain bus stop. So I walked him over to the bus stop I didn't want him to sit and wait by himself, so I wanted to find a way to let him know that I would wait with him. And I kind of intuitively just took his hand and started writing one letter at a time on his palm. The man who had written his name as A-R-T-Z, Arts, is how I knew him at that, in that conversation. He was just a really charismatic, open-hearted, warm person. I was inspired to write a short film about it. I reached out to the Helen Keller National Center, but they are pretty busy over there. I was a bit skeptical about it um, because I had never received any call like that in the past. I remember in the beginning, I remember initially, I was like, I'm not so sure about this. I was politely persistent in reaching out a number of times through emails and calls. I believe it was a lengthy voice message from Doug that I learned about the idea of the film. There are not deafblind actors portraying deafblind characters in, in the media. That's the whole reason that we're standing here today and why we've come up here and why we've been connecting with everyone in the community because we really want to tell this story accurately um, and authentically. I remember sitting in the lobby of this hotel and meeting with Doug and the team. So I was able to talk to Doug in detail about what inspired the story. Right from the start, I knew that I wanted to cast a deafblind actor. It's not common that we're going to see the face of, of these people in media. It's a sort of breakthrough. It's a first. It's never happened before. I can't think of anybody who is deafblind who has ever been cast in any type of movie. It was very obvious to, to, to myself and, and two of my colleagues, and we, we were very excited. Doug told us his story about meeting this guy seven years ago in New York, and I said, I bet we can find him. Within three hours, I got an email from Kathy Kersher, who was a part of that initial meeting, um, telling me that they're like, we found him. It became pretty clear who it was. <laughs> Debbie Kidder goes, Hispanic guy, New York, tactile sign, it's Artie. Like, or at least we know who it is. It's this man named Artemio. We would love to um, reunite with Artemio, who's inspired this story. And then it became a quest. Where is Artemio living at this time? The sad part is we couldn't find Artie after that. <laughs> he has no contact with email and all of that. But that's how small and tight this community is. For months and months and months, they couldn't find Artemio. People basically were saying, gee, I, I, I don't think we're going to be able to find him. I knew that there was so much for me to learn about the community, but also that I was going to really need help finding potential actors to fill this role. I remember starting to think in my mind of who could be potential candidates for Doug to interview. You can come sit here. So how would I encounter this person? Would it be just walking on the street, on the road? And that's initially how the other character meets him. So I'd love to just jump right in and get to know you a little bit more. Carolina, I went to school for the deaf, and that's really where I learned how to sign and learn how to communicate. We'd be using two cameras um, to capture the scenes in a more nuanced and, and efficient way. Trying to figure out their communication style and their communication method so that I can interpret what's going on was challenging at times. Interpreting and translation are very different. Mm -hmm. And interpretation is always going to be an interpretation. Right. It's going to be me trying to, trying my best to get where you're at. Right. It's not a direct translation. There might be one word in English that I might have eight different ways to sign it, 
based on all of the other words around it and what your intent is. So my goal is to interpret the meaning and the essence in the manner in which you convey it so that the deaf or deafblind person will understand it and be able to respond accordingly. At one point in the middle of the day, we had a little bit of a break between auditions. You know, we have options that um, that are not on the list. I don't know if this is good enough for you, but if you would like, you want to meet oh. with Robert. He works in our kitchen. We can pull him over here. Yeah, I'd interested. love to. I think he might be a good I know you just got pulled in here, um, so I'll explain a little bit why we're here. We are making a movie. Um, oh, wait, who's going to be the actor? You? <laughs> oh, no, I know. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. It made me feel so excited. I was like, wait, are you serious? I'm auditioning for something? I don't, you know, you have to remember, I do remember, I work from 10 to 6, Monday to Friday, so... Don't worry about that. We would excuse you from work. Mrs. Robert, are you sure? <laughs> yeah, yes, it's only for a few days. And he's like, I just want to get because you know, if I'm a good home movie star, you know, I don't want to be in trouble with you. You know, and if you, if I'm late, it's on you. He goes, don't worry about it. We will excuse you. But now I felt like this is my dream coming true, that I'm sitting here in this room auditioning for a movie. I'm getting so excited about this now. I love being on camera. Genuinely, the moment Robert walked in the room, I was like, this is our guy. So we were really, really excited to um, call up Robert shortly after and let him know that he'd gotten the role. And he was very excited. I just remember one day I was at work and my boss Dan came over to me. He's like, I'm on the phone right now. And he's like, Doug picked you. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, me, really? Wow, I just couldn't believe it. I was thinking, I did it. I made it. I felt great for him. I was really excited. It was great to learn that he was the person selected. He's such a friendly, charismatic type of person. He's got a good soul. I was born deaf, but I had 20-20 vision. I thought about wanting to become an actor and meeting actors and wanting even to be an actor in a movie. Then at the age of about 30, 31, I started to lose my vision. And it became just so depressing to me. I thought there's no way that anyone would want to hire someone who is not only deaf, but deaf and blind, to become an actor. I have no peripheral vision at all. I have like a tiny box of vision in front of me that I can see through. So his vision on a great day could be this on top of this. Yeah. I mean, Artie is a completely deaf-blind person, whereas I am not. I'm deaf and legally blind, so it was a little bit different for me. We're the same, but we're not. So for me, I was trying to figure out how to play the part of Artie because he had no vision. I mean, who knows? In the future, I might lose all my vision, just like Artie. I don't know what it's going to be like getting you guys together yet and like actually working through it together. Do you have any tips to get me like when I first meet? I have a plan, but like I also like I have no idea. We'll have to figure it out. We'll just like see what it's like when we get moving. They have pretty unique elevators here. There's obviously a lot more buttons in here than most elevators. And you can keep your hand on the button so that uh, when it gets to the floor, this will pop out and it lets you know that you're at your floor. I want him to meet Steven. This is just an opportunity for us to be able to get on our feet, for you and Steven to interact with each other, and for us to start to see where we're at with things. You just gotta go this way, man. Just keep walking. That rehearsal that we did was different from any other rehearsal that I've done before. I remember he came over to me, he tapped me, and he was trying to communicate with me, Tariq, and it was the first time. And he was like trying to guide me. But here I am, I'm this deaf blind person and we were trying to engage with one another. It took a lot of just trusting each other, uh, listening to each other. Even if it's a little awkward for you to do it, even if you wish you didn't have as many things in your hands, that's one of the obstacles that you still need to get past in order to communicate to them. And that first rehearsal was great 
it was um, to have Robert and Steven jump right into it, but it was also really scary as a director because I was like, oh man, I wish we had 20 more rehearsals because there's so much more we need to get through. So. I'm gonna go, oops, Whoa. sorry. I should have here. If I just leave you here, you're not gonna be able to get where you're going. I have an idea. Yeah. So why don't you yeah. and Robert Great. let Tariq be Tariq and let him watch Perfect, him. I love that idea. People, I think, are probably more familiar with what is called TASL, which is Tactile American Sign Language, which is really just using regular visual sign language adapted to the hand. Haptics is, a, it's just a way of touch communication that we use here at Helen Keller. We might have just put our hand on Robert's shoulder, for example, to just mean hold or just to stop. But then there are also some people who might learn the print on palm method, where you actually take letters, use your index finger, and print them on the other person's palm of their hand. It was hard for me to actually use that type of communication because I'm not used to it. So it took me a while to understand what Tariq was trying to communicate to me on the palm of my hand. Yeah, I definitely came away from that first rehearsal pretty nervous. I was pretty sweaty by the time we got out of there and looking around at other people going like, is it hot or is it just me? Because I know Dan's gonna get mad at me if I don't get you back to the cafeteria. <laughs> it was really great to be able to work with the two of them. And, and then also, it, moreover though, it reaffirmed that we had cast the right people. So if you want to cross the street, say you can see or hear, this will get you recognized faster. Great. And then when he's walking, he just needs to just move his cane. Yeah. Like that's all he needs Great. to do. Great. You know, basically we're gonna be outside with like some natural light from street lights, but also like we're gonna be, most of the light that he's gonna feel on him is light that we're introducing. Yeah. I actually have a lot of concerns with what he's gonna be able to right. see from exactly. the exactly. It was in March of 2018 that we had that first meeting with HKNC but it wasn't until November of that year that I got an email the day before we start shooting the film that we found Artemio, or we know where he lives. One of our former staff members had the opportunity to be at a forum, and at that forum um, was Artemio. So now it's the day before we start shooting and we have this address for Artemio, and I was like, well, invite him to set. Let's, let's have him come. Like, you know, what better way to let him know what he's inspired to have him come down to set? I wasn't getting I remember the first time I was standing there on the set. They had to do my makeup, and I was like, oh, is that what movie stars do? Okay, I'm going to sit in the seat and get my makeup done. I'm damn handsome. And Doug took me over to a storefront. And set. Set. Action. We were shooting this film in November in New York City outside at night. So you have the obvious challenges that you might assume of it being quite cold a bunch of the days. I had to follow what Doug was telling me to do, and it was cold and I had to focus on keeping my eyes focused and not act as if I was looking. And it was tough with the weather. You don't need to scan so much, but really, yeah. So just like, I'm, well, I'm scanning because I don't know where he is. Yeah, sure. So that's, that's, that was the scan, just, you know. Right, sure, of course. I think it helped to just provide Robert with a lot of the touch techniques. So giving him signals to indicate keep going or to indicate like, the scene is gonna be cut or to stop, I think really helped out in this situation. He was sticking it out. I, I thought Robert was about to like tap out, but he was like, nah, he said, no, I got this. Like, I just needed a quick breathing. He just got right back up and was like, yeah, we, we're gonna finish this. We're gonna do this. And when he did that, that just tidied me up. And I was like, yo, I, I, I can get through this too. Oh, sorry. It doesn't matter if I'm deaf and legally blind, I still felt like I could do it. We were shooting 
the, almost the whole film outside at night. And in, in, in those settings, Robert really has little to no vision. So something that we needed to figure out ahead of time, how do we break off and create little settings where the interpreter is well lit enough so that him and Robert can communicate? So whoever was not actually interpreting at the moment would hold the light over Robert's shoulder so that the light wouldn't distract him. So it was coming from behind Robert so he wouldn't get any ambient glare and he could actually see the interpreter. What is that? Um, it's called a silent call pager. It's a very simple system. It's just one way. It either chimes or it vibrates. So when they're striking the lights, yep. yeah. Robert will wear that. Amazing. Yeah, that's great. This is your part, so I'm just helping you find it, but it's your role to have. Take more ownership over it. Okay. It was a scene when I, when I had to, like, when he touches me and I kind of, like, shift, I kind of flitch from my reflexes and he was saying that, you know, in real life, like, it's, uh, it's a sad thought that people in this world are afraid of, like, you know, human connection. The point is just communicating. It doesn't matter how you communicate, whether it's through sign language or with pen and paper. There was a kinship that was building between us and I believe that it showed on camera. It was something just magical just happening around everyone on set. Cut. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. Woo! <laughs> I had to let that out, sorry. <laughs> so the shoot comes and goes and we're not able to get in touch with our Temio. A couple days after Christmas of 2018, I was up at HKNC and I was like, I'm gonna just go by his house and see what happens. We are in front of Artemio's house, uh, about to knock on his door. As to our knowledge, he does not know anything about this yet, so we're gonna go in there and do our best to explain why we're there so that we can finally be reunited with Artemio and uh, let him know that he's inspired this film. Might have been better to do this during the daytime. <laughs> just realizing that. But it's dinner time, it's like an approachable hour. Yeah. I heard on number one. Definitely don't want to hop the fence. That would not be a good start to this operation. Any chance have you ever seen anyone, um, if they have a son that's like deaf and blind? I think they do have, yeah, they do have they, Okay, they do. They always lock their gate, yeah, so yeah. usually you have to like yell out. Hello! Hello? I question. Is Artemio your son? Artemio? Yeah. Si. Okay, so we're friends of the Helen Keller National Center. One moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Okay. He's coming. Oh, great. Sorry. Oh, no, no, please. Please. <laughs> My husband. What did Artemio say when you explained who we are and why we're here. Te dijo Artemio cuando nos explicó quiénes somos y por qué estamos aquí. Yo le dije que un amigo de siete años que él conoció está aquí y quiere verlo. I told him a seven-year-old friend that the acquaintance is here and wants to see him. Esto es muy emocionante para mí porque he estado tratando de encontrarlo durante todo el año. Pero al fin lo encontró. Mi nombre es Doug y te conocí hace siete años en un rincón de la calle en el East necesitabas ayuda para encontrar una parada de autobús. Remember, you remember? Very quickly, we realized that the most efficient way for us to communicate was just like how we communicated when we first met each other. Are you an artist? Yes. Filmmaker. Do you want a fresh water? Sure. It had been at this point about seven and a half years exactly since I, the one and only time that I'd met him prior. But the instant he walked down the stairs, like 
his appearance and his energy, it was very familiar. Surprisingly so. Over the course of this year in searching for him, I started building this rounded understanding of who Artemio was through all these other encounters that he'd had with other people. I will tell you more about the film. Soon. It was great to be able to finally fill him in on this whole experience that he's inspired, but it was really just more than anything, just really great to see him again. It was such a pleasure to meet you again. So great to see you again. Doug had never even met a deafblind person in his entire life. Meeting me was his first time encountering a deafblind individual. And we ultimately became friends. Now I'm motivated to learn about becoming an actor and becoming an author similar to Helen Keller. Robert being a part of this experience wasn't a challenge. It made it what it is. It, it, it was such an integral part of creating the environment that, that, was, that pervaded every moment of the shoot. It's in the DNA of every moment of the story that we're telling. It gives other individuals who are deafblind an example of what's possible. So it was, such a, it was a learning and humbling experience all around. I can do anything, just like your typical sighted person can do. It doesn't really matter who the people are. It's about that connection that two people can make. I hope to educate people through the film, so that's my hope for the future. And I hope that Doug, maybe, who knows, he'll give me a shot at doing part two of this movie. The whole journey from the start of meeting Artemio years ago to aligning with Helen Keller National Center to casting Robert as our deafblind actor in the film it has been such an amazing journey and it was it was just so great to have it capped off by reuniting with Artie and getting a chance to share that with him. To really elevate people's you know just awareness about people who are deafblind is tremendous. I feel like at the end when we embrace each other and have the hug I feel like it was showing how people can help each other out. And I felt like that was really something that really left an impact on me. Because we are all not alone in this world. Everybody needs each other. Everybody needs help. And everybody can help each other out. <laughs>